Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good to be with you. It has been an incredible day in church. I feel like we could just pray and dismiss and all of us would say that church was amazing because there is nothing more incredible than witnessing life change, amen? Than just seeing God transform people and families and homes. Um, I was really touched because uh, Rachel and Joel got baptized and their mom was playing the piano and turned over and watching them as they're getting baptized. And I just think that's the most beautiful thing in the world. So can we give it up for everybody that got baptized today? So incredible. Uh, we are um, going to be wrapping up our Peace of Mind series today. How many of you guys have just learned something, enjoyed something? Um, I hope that uh, throughout this series, you have been encouraged that in Jesus, there's peace available for your mind. That there is peace for anxiety and weariness and burnout and depression. And what we're gonna talk about on our final week today is that there is peace available for our minds for addiction. And I recognize that addiction is a heavy topic. And I also recognize this thing is that when you hear the word addiction, and I just said that we're going to be talking about that today, there's probably a good number of you here today that have just decided, number one, that you get to tune me out because you don't struggle with addiction, um, because you don't maybe, maybe don't struggle with one of the more obvious addictions, so this message is not for you. Or you've decided that you're just going to think about that one person in your life who's going through an obvious addiction and hopefully like pass this on to them and ask them to listen to the stream later. But I want to encourage you with this, that uh, addiction is something that at one point in our lives, every single one of us has struggled with. A, a, a way of thought, a pattern, a behavior, something that you've had to fight actively against. And I know this because sin exists in the lives of every single one of us. And just because we are a Christian doesn't mean we don't struggle with sin, right? So my hope and prayer is that you would be filled with encouragement today that there is freedom for addiction. <coughs> that there is freedom for addiction. <clears throat> and so we're going to dive in here today, and I want to give us just a little bit of background on the, the, the definition of addiction. And it is, Webster's Dictionary defines it as a surrender of one's self to something obsessively or habitually. It means doing something over and over again. Addiction can be described as um, being unable to get out, being caught up in a behavior or a thought <clears throat> or a way of life. <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. Um, and, and so there's different ways in the Bible that addiction is described. While the word addiction is never used in the Bible literally, there's a lot of words in the Bible that speak to the nature of addiction, the implications of addiction. Some of those are words like being bound, being held captive, right? Uh, there is a phrase to be mastered by things, which speaks to the nature of addiction. Uh, Paul says, while everything is lawful for me, I will not be mastered by any. There's another word, and that word is entangled. We see entangled. The Bible says, throw off the sin that so easily entangles us, keeps us bound, right? This is speaking to addiction. But I think the, the word in the Bible that speaks to addiction that I really want to zero in on today is the word stronghold. Because the Bible has a lot to say about the word stronghold. And, and, and again, we're filled with hope. I want to just weave hope in Thank you so much. Um, we've hope in throughout our entire message because there's hope for addiction. There's freedom for addiction. Second Corinthians 10 says that we have been given the power through Jesus to demolish every stronghold. So that's good news for us. Amen. What is a stronghold? It's a habitual pattern of thought which plays out in a behavior. It's a habitual pattern of thought that plays out in a behavior. The Bible describes strongholds as the spiritual nature to an addiction. It's a spiritual nature to an addiction. One of the things that I want us to understand today, that I want us to just receive in our hearts, is that there is a spiritual connection to every single addiction that we have. There's a spiritual connection to every single addiction that we have. Isn't it true 
that the world is full of strategies and answers for how we should and can break addictions in our lives, right? Whether it's addiction to drugs or alcohol or coffee or social media or whatever it is, there's a 12-step program on how to do it, right? There's a strategy. All you have to do is read this book. All you have to do is 21 days, not do it. You'll build a habit and then you won't do it, right? But isn't it true that all of the ways that the world offers for us to break addictions attacks the behavior and doesn't get to the root of the problem, right? And until we can understand that there is a spiritual connection, there's a root to every single thing that plays out in an addiction or in a behavior, we can't actually get free. So it's really good that we came to church today because 12 step programs and self-help books will only go so far. We need the power of God through his Holy Spirit to reveal to us what is the root to the behaviors that I struggle with so that if I can address that, confront it, identify it, and get healing from it, he's gonna set me free from the symptoms that it plays out in, amen? So that's good news for us. How many of us have a kitchen appliance on our counter? Raise your hand, you have a toaster, you have an air fryer, you have a coffee pot. We're grateful for all of those appliances because they make our lives easier, right? But isn't it true that an appliance on its own, not connected to power, is no good for us, right? Like it doesn't function. And so if I wanted to toast some bread and I plugged in my toaster, but my power in my house is not working, my toaster's not gonna work. And I can get frustrated and I can say, this toaster is garbage and it's not working and it's not doing what I want it to do. So I'm gonna throw it away and get a new one. And I could pay a thousand dollars for the best toaster on the planet. But if I don't have power in my house to turn on the toaster, I'm not getting toasted bread, right? No matter what I do, there is a source that fuels whatever needs to happen for the toaster to work. There is a spiritual connection. There's a source that plays itself out in behaviors and things that we feel trapped in that we can find ourselves addicted to. I wanna just really quick go through a couple of addictions that we might be able to face. Because I really believe that without figuring out the spiritual connection, we can't really break the addiction that we're trying to break. And so I want us to just talk through these different addictions and we're gonna talk about the cause for the behaviors that we can find ourselves in because until we talk about the cause, we can't get to the cure. So we're gonna do that. There's a couple of different addictions that I wanna cover. Clearly, there's a really long list. We're gonna hit a couple of them. Obviously, there's addiction to drugs, right? Which affects millions of people um, in the United States. And, and what I want us to understand about drug addiction is that it almost never starts with hard drugs. There is a crisis in our country right now because of the use and abuse of pain medication that has opened the door to harder drugs. People who never in their life thought that they would find themselves addicted that are now addicted. So we've gotta change the stereotype on what drug addiction even looks like so that we can confront it and overcome it, amen? amen. Alcohol, this can be something that starts socially, but it ends up consuming your life and can destroy relationships and literally end your life, right? Alcoholism kills three million people in this world every single year. Gambling. Phil Mickelson is one of the best golfers of all time. And it has been said that he said that his gambling addiction spanned 30 years and cost him $1 billion. When he talked about his addiction to gambling on social media, he said, it's not even the money that I lost because I've always had financial security. It's not even the money that I lost that was the problem for me. It's the amount of time that I spent away from the people that I love and the harm that I did with my relationships that I, I can never get back. There's addictions to gaming. Did you know that for the gamer who is a young person, they will most likely on average rack up 10,000 hours of playing time by the time they turn 21. That is the same amount of time that they will have spent in a classroom from junior high all the way through high school with perfect attendance. 10,000 hours. There's 5 million people in the United States who spend 40 hours a week gaming. 40 hours a week gaming. It's crazy. 
There's a rapidly growing number of rehab facilities for gamers and therapy and offices because this has become such an epidemic. We have addictions to food. And, and this addiction to food can be on either extreme. There's the addiction to food in overeating and indulgence and gluttony, but there's also an addiction to the health industry and what we perceive as being healthy, but as actually become obsessive and consuming. There's emotional eating, there's disordered eating, there's under eating, but there is an addiction to food. There's a work addiction. We have workaholics where you know it's destroying your life and destroying your relationships, but you cannot turn it off. You cannot step away from your work. And that's a problem. Exercise addiction, this again starts as something healthy, but if it becomes all we think about and it consumes us, then it's a problem. There's digital addiction, addiction to technology and social media, which every single one of us struggle with. There's a statistic that says on average, we touch our phones 2,600 times a day. We touch our phones 2,600 times a day. Students, adults live with AirPods in their ears. We don't even know how to function without technology and it is a problem that every one of us. So hopefully one of these addictions is hitting a little close to home, right, <laughs> today. There's a shopping addiction. Everyone's like, leave that one alone, will you? <laughs> let me shop on Amazon in peace, right? But there's this there's this desire, this discontentment to always never have enough, right? To always, always purchase and click and go into debt and that can destroy people. And then there's some, there's, there's a, another big one, which is a sexual addiction. And this is an addiction to um, everything from adultery to sex in and of itself, to pornography, to perversion. And isn't it true that we live in a sex crazed culture and it's a problem that's not only in society, but it is in the church. And church, it's not just happening everywhere, it's happening here. I was at a lunch with pastors uh, with an organization that is working and doing incredible work called Think Twice to end, uh, or, or not to end, but to confront um, youth and um, just sexual health, but also just life, and they're an incredible organization. But they shared some statistics that Yakima, Washington, our county, has youth with the highest rates of STDs and sexual activity than any other county in Washington state. Any other county in Washington state, not just on the east side, that, that a, a sexually active high schooler today in Yakima has an average of three partners a week. This is a problem and it's in our backyard. It's here, it's right here. And so we need Jesus's help, wouldn't you say? There, there's some less obvious addictions that we struggle with. Remember, it's a surrender to oneself that leads to something obsessive or habitual. Isn't it true that if that is the definition, a lack of self-control, anger, compulsive lying, all of these things can be things that if they consume us and become who we are and become our master, we can find ourselves struggling with these strongholds in our lives. And, and I think what's often the case is that addictions start with trying to fill an appropriate appetite in an inappropriate way, right? How many of us know all of these things in and of themselves? Some of them are wrong, period, right? But some of these things can start as something that's okay, right? Exercise can start good. There's a difference between, but then it can get obsessive and it can become detrimental. A glass of wine is different than not being able to function without alcohol, right? And so there are, there's this need to fill an appetite that starts appropriate and ends up inappropriate. What I think is, is a question that we all need to wrestle with is, and we're gonna, get, we're gonna touch this several times throughout our message, what is it that masters me? What's my master? What is it that I can get caught up in and how, with Jesus' help, can I get free from it? The word of God is living and active, so we're gonna let it speak to us this morning, amen? Luke chapter four, verse one through 21, where Jesus has a confrontation with the devil himself says this, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. 
The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it'll all be yours. Jesus answered, it's written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, temptation number three, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command all of his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you won't strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him. Jesus returned to Galilee, full in the power of the spirit and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began saying to them, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In Luke chapter four, Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. And what we know about Jesus is that he was fully God, fully man. He's in the wilderness for 40 days and he's hungry. How many of us can relate? I can get hungry after 40 minutes, okay? I, I don't even know 40 hours. I don't even know if that's possible. 40 days, Jesus is hungry and the devil knows that. So he comes up to him and he tempts him. How many of us know that just because we got saved didn't mean that our flesh died? How many of us know that we're gonna encounter and experience temptations as long as the devil exists? Until we get to heaven, we are gonna struggle with temptation. So if anybody told you that when you get saved, temptations disappear, I'm so sorry, they lied, right? All of us are in this boat, every single one of us. And uh, I think that's why Paul in Romans chapter seven, he, he addressed just the nature of humanity and the struggle with sin when he said, man, I know what I should do, right? Paul said this, but then I do what I shouldn't do. And then I know what I shouldn't do, and I end up doing that thing. So he talks about this human struggle. And, and I think one of the things that is so true in our lives is that Satan's tactics will never stop coming, but God can help us to resist against the devil like Jesus did, right? Jesus resisted. Here's a couple of things that we need to know about Satan is that he will hit us where we are the most weak and the most vulnerable. See, he didn't come to Jesus and tempt him with a woman or tempt him with gambling. He tempted him with food because he was hungry, right? He tempted him with power because he was mocking Jesus and quoting him. You said that you're powerful, right? Isn't it true that while Satan is a schemer, he's not very creative and he knows your weak spots. He knows where you're the most vulnerable and he will go back to those again and again and again. He doesn't even need to introduce something new for us. Whatever it is that is our weakness, whatever wound we have in our life, that is the avenue through which God will go, the devil will go to try to trip us up, get us stuck, get us bound and develop a stronghold in our life. One of the things that the devil uses because he is the father of low blows is when we go through a hard season, where we are disappointed, we are discouraged, we go through loss, we go through tragedy, that is when he comes in and offers us a temporary solution that can never actually satisfy or fill. That's where he'll lead us to a substance to fill the emptiness. He uses those moments of weakness and vulnerability. Why do we need to know this? Because when we are aware of our weaknesses, then we can identify what they are and stand strong against them, right? But this is what Satan does. He hits us where we're weak and vulnerable. And the second thing that Satan does is he always lies. He is a liar. He was lying to Jesus in Luke chapter four when he promised him all these things. Then you can worship, then you can do all this. He was completely lying and he lies to us. 
Satan has a cycle. And if we can know what the cycle is, then again, we can identify it and then we can get over whatever he's trying to do and we can be more than conquerors in Jesus. Here's his cycle. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. He starts with temptation in the same way that he tempted Jesus. He hits us where we're weak and he tempts us, right? So now we have this temptation that we've got to struggle with. So he presents the opportunity for addiction. He presents the opportunity for sin. And then he moves to his second play. The second play is justification. Because if he can get, just get us to justify our behavior, then we will normalize it and we will start to think that all we can do is manage our addiction, suppress it, live with it instead of conquer it. And he'll use justification to do that. He will, he will lie to us in a way that tries to make us make sense of whatever it is that we are participating in. I'm gonna give you an example of what this could look like. I love Mexican food. Happy Cinco de Mayo to everyone, right? Who likes Mexican food? Amen, you're in Yakima. I think, you, I think it's a prerequisite for living here. And I love like those moments when you go out and you just know you're gonna have a good meal, right? You're gonna like order up and you're just so excited. I love Mirador, the restaurant, not the one here, very clearly stated, the one over there by Walmart in East Valley. And I just like get excited because like I know I'm gonna go and there's like chips and salsa and there's warm beans and I'm gonna eat and then I'm gonna order, if I'm really feeling it, I'm gonna order the Tres Amigos plate and it feeds 12 people. And, and, and all of their dishes feed 12 people, but it's like stewed beef with an enchilada in the middle and then like stewed pork with chile verde. It's amazing with rice and beans, tortillas. And, and, and I should share, but I'm not. And, and, and here's what I tell myself in my mind, if I'm gonna order that meal, here's how I justify my ability to order that meal. I know it's not healthy, it's fine. I'm gonna order a Diet Coke. When I really could have ordered a regular Coke, but because I ordered a Diet Coke, it makes whatever I'm eating healthy, right? Like I could be so much worse, but I'm making a good decision because I'm ordering Diet Coke, right? Like you go out for pizza and you're like, I'll have the Diet Mountain Dew, please. Just to kind of like soften the blow of whatever it is, right? Isn't it true that this is what the devil does? At least what I'm doing is not like hurting anyone. I'm a gambler, but at least I'm not like a murderer. Like it could be so much worse. I, I have an addiction to whatever it is, you fill in the blank, but at least I'm still married. At least my family's doing fine. I at least I'm not as bad as this other guy or this other gal. A and if he can just get us to justify it, then we will just live managing it and we won't ever overcome it. And then here's what happens, we'll justify it. And then his third, his third tool comes into play, the third part of the cycle, because then we'll do it. We will succumb to the addiction, we'll fall to the stronghold, and then we feel shame and guilt. Can't believe I did that. I said it was my last time. I said I was gonna be done. And in that shame and guilt, we're in a place of weakness and vulnerability. And what happens when we're weak and vulnerable? He will tempt us again. And now we've just gone back into the cycle. But aren't you thankful that in Jesus, there is freedom from that cycle. We don't have to live like that. We don't have to live in this cycle that the enemy sends to us. He, he, he tempts Jesus in the desert and then he tries to justify it, right? And Jesus doesn't fall for it. He's able to resist which is what he wants for all of our lives. And then what does it say happens? It says that he leaves that place. He's full of the spirit because he didn't fall. And he goes back into Galilee and he ends up in Nazareth, which is where his birth home was. That's where he was brought up. And he starts his public ministry. He walks into the synagogue and he starts to quote Isaiah. And this prophecy in Isaiah is now fulfilled in this moment, which is so incredible. And Jesus starts to say, I have come to set the captives free, to bring free freedom to the oppressed, right? So that the blind can see. I have come to proclaim freedom to those who, and he says, the Lord has anointed me to do this. And it says that everybody there was impacted by his words. Do you see yourself in any of those? I have come to give sight to the blind, to set the captives free. 
Has that ever been you at one point of your life? Here's what I think is so beautiful about this story is that Jesus, in a moment where he could have temporarily gratified his flesh, his flesh by taking the food that the devil was offering him, would have missed the opportunity to be used of God to deliver this word. But because he kept his eyes on, on God and he kept his mission in focus, he was able to overcome this temptation and get about his father's business. I wonder if the times that we struggle with our addictions is because we have gotten our eyes off of the truth that God has more for us to do, that there's a purpose for our lives. And if we're gonna be useful to fulfill the eternal, we have to be able to say no to the temporary. We have to be able to say, this is gonna satisfy me for a moment, but God has more for me. He has better for me. I actually don't have time to sit around in this mud because God has an assignment for me. And because Jesus did that, he was able to deliver a word that set captives free and fulfilled prophecy. That's exciting, amen? That's what he desires for every single one of us in our lives. Isn't it true that oftentimes with addiction, in a moment with Jesus, it can change everything. And God has miraculously set people free from addiction, where they were bound and then one minute to the next, they never touch alcohol, drugs, whatever it is ever again. And that can happen. But more often, the way that God does these miracles in our lives, the way that he sets us free is not in a one instant moment, but it is inviting us to partner with him to do the work, to partner with him in the miracle. So many times in the Old Testament, when God would tell the Israelites that he was gonna deliver them, I'm gonna deliver you um, from the hands of the, and fill in the blank of the army, right? They were always in, at battle. I'm gonna deliver you from the hand of the Amalekites, right? I'm gonna, I'm gonna save you from this army. Here's what he wasn't saying. I've got it, go home, take a nap, I'll tell you when it's over. Right? That wasn't his promise. See, he promised that he was gonna deliver the Israelites, but what did they need to do? They needed to go home, put their boots on, strap up for battle, partner with God to do the work and go out there knowing that God was already gonna make them victorious, but they needed to get out there. And whatever it is that you feel stuck in, know that God is inviting you to partner with him to do the work. So many times you're like, God, set me free. God, I know you can do it, heal me. But he's inviting us into the work of what healing looks like. Every day, waking up, making the decision that we're gonna say no to temptation, that we're gonna do right, that we're gonna be in God's word, that we're gonna keep our eyes fixed on him, that we're gonna remember who our master is so that we can get about the father's business and find freedom for our lives. How do we do this? How do we do this in a practical way? I wanna read Colossians 3 verse one through 14 or through 12, it says this. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways, in the life that you used to live, but now rid yourselves of all such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self and all of its what? Practices. You've taken it off, it's over. So what does he say to do? Put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, scathian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. What does he tell us to do if we want freedom from addiction? Number one, think clearly. He says, set your mind on things above. Isn't it true that there is so much power in perspective? That as the Holy Spirit helps us to figure out the cause to what it is and why it is that we feel the way we do and we think the way we do, that God can help us transform our minds. 
that sometimes we're so stuck in the mess of it all that we can't even see what's beyond it. But church, we need God's help to step back and say, where do I want to be? What do I want for my life? What does God want for my life? And how do I get there? And God, how can you help me get there? What do I need to do so that I can fulfill your plans and purposes for my life? Set your mind on things above. Set your mind on things that are eternal. That word set means always seeking. It means that we're never done. Every day, we defeat the lies of the enemy by setting our mind on things above and asking God for a clear mind. A couple weeks ago, we talked about how our mind has the power to be renewed. Physically, we can create new neural pathways in our mind. God can do that as we surrender our life to Him and we keep our eyes fixed on Him. Number two, act decisively. It's incredible how he uses such strong language when he says, put to death, put to death these things. Church, we need to deal radically with sin. The devil is not messing around. So we need to stop messing around. What is it that needs to be taken out of your home? Is it a job that's toxic that the people there just keep you stuck and you need to move? You need a new place of employment. You need new friends because the ones you have are not, are not taking you down the path that you need in your life. You, you need to delete some things. You need to shift some things. You need to throw away some things when you get home. Deal radically with sin. Put to death these things. He said, that's what you used to do when you had your old life and all of your old practices, but that's gone. If you want freedom in Christ, we have to do the work to put to death those things because God's not gonna come and throw those things in away, away in our house our, himself, right? We've gotta do it. And put on your new self and take a hold of the freedom that is available to you. I wanna bring up that question again. What is your master? What is it that masters you? What, what did you start that you were initially so in control of that is now out of control? I think one example that people don't talk about often enough, but it is something that is taking hold of our country and it's not just women, it's men too, is this slippery slope of food. This idea of wanting health and wellness, wanting to treat our bodies well because they're, they're a temple of God, which I completely agree with and wanting to do it for God, to honor Him. But there's a slippery slope that we can go down, isn't there? Where all of a sudden we take our eyes off of our master who is Jesus, and we start to put it on attaining this level of perfection or this image that we see because we can't be reminded that we are created in the image of our Creator. And so what happens? We become a slave to the latest diet pill, fad, workout program, calorie counting, all of which are incredible. Step trackers, they're amazing. They help us, but when it consumes us and it paralyzes us, it's become a stronghold in our life. It's become our master. When gaming starts as, as just something fun to do because it's a hobby and it's fun, which I know that it is, but it becomes a place to numb your pain and to escape and to avoid and to hide away. It has become your master. And you know what breaks my heart about these things that we can tend to normalize, that we don't even recognize has become our master is when we catch, when we find ourselves stuck in these places, here's what we are saying, church. God, who you are and what you say about me isn't enough. So I've got to try to fix it myself. What you say about if we're talking about health, what you say about my body, that it is beautiful, that it is worthy, that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, what you say isn't enough. So I've got to try to figure it out myself. Church, Jesus needs to be enough for us. He needs to be our only source of identity and joy and peace and calling and purpose because all of those other things, they're going to steer us away and they might satisfy for a little while and it might feel like we were in control and we got this for a little while. But if Jesus is not the center of our affection and our devotion and our lives, we will get stuck. Jesus needs to be our master. And I wanna ask you today, what is the cause for the things that you struggle with today? 
Is there an experience that you've had in your life of fear, of disappointment? Who told you that you weren't worthy of love, that led you to a place where you felt like the only thing you could do was fill in the blank? And I really believe that God in His Spirit is revealing to you right now questions, people, experiences, loss, grief, where you started to believe the lies of the enemy. What is the cause? Because if we can identify what the cause is, it'll lead us to the cure. What's the cure? The cure is the truth. Church, we need to start declaring the truth of God over every single lie and stronghold in our life. Why? Because the Bible says that the truth is what's going to set us free. The truth is going to set us free. Some of us need to start declaring the truth of God over our lives. Some of us have been living under, everybody's searching for an identity in this world. Well, I am a, I have anxiety. I am an alcoholic. I am a porn addict. And we need to stop saying that and we need to start saying, I'm a child of God. And I struggle with this, but this isn't who I am. This doesn't determine my life. This is something that I've battled, but I'm not gonna be overcome by it. And I'm not just gonna normalize it and live under it, but with God's help, I'm gonna declare every day who God is and who He says that I am. So every morning, we need to wake up and say, I'm free, I'm free. I know I messed up yesterday or five minutes ago, but I'm free in Jesus' name. I'm a child of God. God has plans for me. He has purposes for me. Jesus came to set the oppressed free. I'm worthy of love. I can receive his forgiveness in my life. And as we begin to declare his truth, it is going to change the direction of our thoughts and our actions because God's word and what he says about us is living and it's active. What's a practical way to do this is read God's word. If we wanna know the truth of God, we have to know the word of God. So open his word, read what it says. Sometimes we'll talk to people and they're like, you know, reading the Bible's hard because I don't understand all of it. I was just talking to somebody last Sunday. They were completely unchurched, went to Lower Valley because they got invited to a child dedication. And he said these words to me, I love that we go through books of the Bible because I didn't know what the Bible was. And I'm learning how to read it because of how you guys are teaching it. Maybe you're here today and you don't fully understand. I heard this illustration that when we go to the doctor's office and we have an injury or an illness and we get prescribed a medication, raise your hand if you know every ingredient in that medication. We don't, right? We're like, we can't even pronounce the medication. Like the pharmacist is like, what do you need? I don't know, read the scribble because I, I don't even know how to pronounce it. And, and here's what we do. We don't know what the medicine is made out of, but we trust the doctor or the pharmacist, and here's what we do. We ingest it anyway, because we believe that as we take it in, it'll do its work in our body, right? So even when we don't fully understand, we take it in and it does its work. Read God's word. And even if you don't fully understand, trust that as you take it in, it's gonna do its work. It's gonna transform your life. And, and one of these days, one of these verses, you're gonna start believing what the Bible says about you. If you are stuck in a pattern of just a stronghold in your life, I want you to do this every single day for the foreseeable future. I want you to read three chapters, Romans 6, Romans 7, and Romans 8. Romans 6, Romans 7, and Romans 8. Romans 6 tells us and teaches us that in verse 11, we're dead to sin, but we're alive with Christ. Verse 14, that sin is not our master. We are alive in Christ. Chapter seven teaches us that the struggle to sin is real. Right, Paul talks about that struggle that we just mentioned. This is a part of being human. But Romans 8 reminds us that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, that we can have victory over sin and victory over strongholds and addictions. The Bible says in Romans chapter eight, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor principalities, nothing can separate us from the love of God. If we want freedom, we need to read it and receive his truth and declare it. So I'm gonna invite us to stand all over this place this morning because if I'm honest, I have felt just such a spirit of heaviness today because addiction is real and addiction is heavy. 
but there's freedom for it in Jesus' name. I'm so encouraged by those who got baptized today who said, I, I had a life of addiction, but Jesus has set me free. In fact, if you're here today and God has set you free from something in your life ever, would you raise your hand? Come on, keep your hand raised. Every person who's struggling out here today, I want you to look at these hands and I want you to be encouraged that if God could do it for them, He can do it for you. And He will do it again and again and again because He's good and He's faithful and He's powerful. So we're gonna sing these words and we're gonna declare this out. And I'm gonna pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, He starts to reveal these things in you so that you can know what it is and you can find freedom available in Jesus. Come on, we're conquerors. We have victory over sin, over addiction. In Jesus' name.